Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Marisa LaFleur, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Megan Alpert and Jose Angel Arbuz, presenting their poetry collections, The Animal at Your Side and An Empty Pot's Darkness, respectively. I hope you're all safe and hanging in there during this challenging time. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Through virtual events like this one, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community during these challenging times. Every week we will be hosting events here on our Zoom account. And as always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and even browse our bookshelves from your home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button right at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting links to purchase The Animal at Your Side and An Empty Pot's Darkness at harvard.com, and I'll also be posting a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible, and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you so much for showing up and tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings the past many months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. And we thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Megan Alpert is a writer whose poetry has appeared in Colorado Review, Crab Orchard Review, Harvard Review, and many others. As a journalist, she has reported for The Atlantic, Smithsonian, and The Guardian. She has won an Orlando Poetry Prize from A Room of Her Own Foundation and has been a fellow at Vermont Studio Center, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, the Evolve Marquette Creative Re Residency, and the studios at Mass Mocha. Her poetry collection featured tonight, The Animal at Your Side, won the Airly Prize and was a finalist for the natural, National Poetry Series. Playing with form and structure, the poems examine the feeling of unrootedness and celebrate what it is to be, what is to be treasured in weirdness, queerness, the ecstatic and the erotic. The online poetry publication Harbor Review called it a travelogue of the soul. Jose Angel Araguz is a writer and assistant professor of English at Suffolk University. He's also a Contamundo fellow and an editor. His poems, creative nonfiction, and reviews have appeared in Crab Creek Review, Prairie Schooner, and New South, among others, and he runs the poetry blog The Friday Influence. He is the author of seven chapbooks and four collections. His most recent collection, An Empty Pot's Darkness, engages with the ideas of life, love, death, and friendship, each piece exploring the nuances of life in eight lines of poetry. The poet Laura M. Kaminsky describes the poems as deftly woven tapestries. These poems and the silences within them kept me turning the pages and turning back to read again. We're so pleased to have them both with us here tonight. Without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Megan and Jose. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Marisa, and thanks to everybody at Harvard Bookstore that planned this event. Um, I actually used to work at Harvard Bookstore and when I worked there, I dreamed of one day having a book of my own and reading in that um, very room where I saw other authors read. I did not think that I would be doing it online during a pandemic the day after an armed insurrection in the Capitol. Um, I love Harvard Bookstore. Um, I love independent bookstores. They do things for the writing community that shopping online can never do. So I hope that um, people who come to this event today choose to buy their books from Harvard Bookstore or from a local independent bookstore where you are. Um, I'm gonna start with a poem. Oh wait, I'm going to, yes, I'm going to start with a poem. This is called What We Kept. We kept the war under our tongues, kept it in our hamstrings, in our bones. We kept the war in our cereal bowls, 
in our juice, kept it in our first love, standing in the porch light, waiting to be kissed. We kept it close in the hems of our shirts, our face cream, kept it in our bad skin. We kept it in our driveways, sitting quiet in the yard, flying the Bronx River Parkway, 2 a.m., kept it in key rings smashed into tables, the imprints they left on our palms. We kept it door to door, moss green in hinges, kept it mean under our fingernails, forgotten in our socks. Sometimes we stood at the edge of a blueberry field, birds lit by the last of the sun. But under our skin, the whir click of the war beginning. Um, so that's a poem um, that I chose for today in part because it, for me, is about the way the actions of the state that we live in can exist in our bodies. And um, I think a lot of work has been done and um, words have been written about the way that trauma lives in the body. Um, but I want to point out that that poem is about living in a country that is making a war elsewhere um, and having that war live with us even when we're pretending that it's not. Um, so I, I guess planning, <laughs> planning this event um, in light of the, uh, the events of the last um, 24 hours has felt a little strange. Um, it's felt a little strange to turn from this very um, violent external um, event that we, I think, all have been watching with a lot of fear and a lot of anger to this very internal world of poetry. Um, Chris Salerno is a poet who's been working a lot on masculinity. And he wrote a Facebook post yesterday that I thought was really apt about how um, the kind of power that we can get from systems like white supremacy, those of us who have access to this power, white supremacy and toxic masculinity kind of, um, kind of asks us to turn away from pain. And um, my hope for poetry is that it can return us to ourselves and that it can be a doorway back into the pain that we might need to confront, even if it's something that seems really small, like I'm sad about something that happened in my family. Um, and that in doing this, um, the kind of um, violence and power that we saw yesterday becomes less attractive and less addictive as a drug. Um, so I, I guess I say this as a way of saying, I do believe poetry has a place on a day like today. And I, I think we're here to kind of participate in some of our shared humanity. So now I'm gonna read a poem that's in a whole other world um, that's much more domestic. This is called Island. She would cry every time we put her in the carriage. That was all right. And the way I had to lean sideways to make her sleep her soft breath on my face smelled like waste. My back would heal and she would nurse. My nipples still blew when the sound of the ocean stopped. Sometimes the trees bend toward me and I'll feel something like it or taste it just before. The gold dripping off the leaves just before it sweetens and betrays. Um, so a lot of this book is about the idea of home and how to create a home um, when you feel particularly uprooted from your family of origin and your home of origin. And so I think a lot of the poems are like little experiments in like, maybe this will work. Maybe this is how you make a home. And this one is written in the voice of a person that I would like to be. Um, it's called Crafting. 
Let us not bruise a single onion or throw away a single bite of peach. If you have a home, open it. Take in vegetables and homeless youth. Patch the places where their mother ripped hair from their scalp. Tuck carrot peels back into earth. Take in this muddy river. Banks rise, then freeze and snow again. Take it in your mouth, the headline. Boy, 15, charged with murder. As you are charged with water, charged to clean the muddy boot stains by the door. Not the murder, but the fracture it covers. Make home big enough to fit all of this and vegetables and meat. Kids whose lip prints you must clean from glasses, who thunder up and down the stairs, who must be made dinner and spoken to with an unfractured voice. Take the glove that got left in the river. Your own sadness, snap it open in the basement in the yellow lights. The table littered with feathers, bones. Feet shuffle upstairs, stomp, then rest. Your work laid out before you, and almost enough time. Um, so the book is divided into different sections based on landscape, um, with the first section being out in the woods, um, the second sec section all being poems by the water. And then this third section, which I'm reading a bunch from tonight is all about houses. Um, so this one is called When Day is Done and um, it's gonna involve me singing. Uh, I'm not a professional singer, so don't be alarmed if my voice comes out sounding badly. Um, the the voice singing in the poem is my mother's voice, who is also not a professional singer. Um, so it'll be very realistic what you're gonna hear. When day is done. My parents chose a house with ghosts. Where we ripped up the rugs, we found phrases scratched into the floor and where the wallpaper had stripped into hooks. Red sentences stuck into sconces and lit, we ate our dinner. I folded my hips into an envelope, slipped under a door. Sleep, a voice rasped from the keyhole, and the letters began to tighten. So my mother started singing at my bed. Ramona. Da 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 dee da 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 da. Cutting another hallway into my heart. Um, one thing about the book that I think trips people up is that it's about it comes from a very personal place, but it's not autobiographical. And so I want to read the first poem in the book um, because I like it, but it's a poem that it's probably the number one poem that people most assume is autobiographical and it's not. Um, this is called Dawn. My sister comes home smelling of dirt she was buried in dandelion milk under her nails. We wash her arms, scrub her fingers with stinging soap, but still she is not clean. When she finally speaks, it's hand me that trowel and I'll bury the seeds. While upstairs, our grandmother paces the attic. Will I wake anywhere besides this house or love anyone ever beyond my sister with the skinned knees? I wake again in the garden, crushing stems against my teeth.
Um, this poem is called Reporting from Oil Block 16. We rode to the oil camp in the back of a pickup on the road that had scared away the animals. He said his story on the electric company had been pulled and we talked to corruption. De hecho, he said, I was a pastor. A year ago, my wife me engañó y no pude seguir. Mi corazón. In Spanish, you can say this to a stranger. No se siente bien, I finally tried. No, he smiled, looking down. No, it doesn't feel good. My back hurt from the weight of the tape recorder. The air of the forest lit us up. Wells and pipelines hidden behind trees whose names and uses we did not know. And I should add that um, Oil Block 16 is actually a really specific place in the Amazon. And that for all my, these poems are not autobiographical. There are three poems in the book that I did write about reporting from the Amazon. And those poems are all true. Um, I didn't feel like it was ethical to do like myth making around um, actual reporting that I did about, um, about this situation, um, a, a conflict that had been caused by oil development. So I'm gonna read one more poem from the book and then I'm gonna read a couple of new poems. Um, and this poem, like the last poem features some words in Spanish and I feel like I should add that if my Spanish was once, <laughs> was once advanced um, when I was um, doing this kind of reporting and living abroad, it has, it has um, downgraded to very much intermediate. So um, this is a poem about being a, being a language learner of Spanish. Um, it's called Desahogarse. In Spanish, home, hogar, sounds like drown, ahogar. But Laura tells me there's no relation. At Laura's house, we leave doors open because we want to laugh and gather. Laura shares the big bed with her mother, even when they are not speaking. This ahogarse is to unburden yourself, not to undrown or even to unhome. When I go home, I still don't know how to talk. Casa is house and casarse to marry. And when you marry yourself with another, you house yourself, I think. In my house, any closed door was open, so I could not be naked. In the catalog of dreams about my mother, there's one where I search for keys in her white apartment, a place she's never lived. I'm leaving, unhoming myself without drowning. When I go back to the house, it's different. I still don't know what to do with the voices in the attic, but downstairs, outside, in the huge lights, the windows throw across the dark, a deer bucks and leaps in the driveway. And I can stand there, watch it dancing. Um, so that's the animal at your side. Um, and I think I'll read maybe two newer poems. Um, I have been working on a new project that I actually started in 2016, in November 2016, um, about anger. And I had some anger poems to read to you today, but I think they might be too angry. So um, I'm going to read a couple other poems from that same project that are um, maybe a little gentler. This one is called um, Unsignified. One. There's part of me that isn't a girl. When she stamps and rages, red lights shoot along the ground. Unafraid of the moss hung woods, she goes there when the world wants to erase her. 
or to the ocean floor, shapeshifted, tentacled, writhing and lighting up. Tetras float around her. She sends up a wave of sound. Two. Once I had a friend. We dreamed in two genders. And when we woke, we spoke of invisible things. Three. Sometimes your love constructs like a foreign language. From a country where everyone knows who they are. I visit, you push my hair into the style of the women and pull me towards their sound. There's part of me this country never touches. Four, once you came to the undersea. We'd tossed for days in a ship near your shore I took your hand and plunged, your eyes to mine through the blue. You took a delicate tentacle into your mouth. Um, and I'm gonna close with, um, I guess I lied. I am gonna read one anger poem. I wrote a couple poems that um, have a lecto in the title, Electo is one of the, um, the Furies. Uh, she's, her name means unending anger. Um, and these poems are really about anger as a healing force. So I am going to read one of them. Um, this is called Re Electo Return. I wish I could tell you I climbed those killing bluffs of black, ro black rocks scarfed with snow, only to bring back something we could live on. That I took the elements I had, love, coercion, lies, fear, as if they were mere igneous stones and forged them into shapes that I could use. Instead, I hid, kept pelts of animals, dried blood, boric acid, his voice clattering to the cave floor as crystals. I examined them for faults, visible breath of silica, held them as protection against believing what I now believe. When I was nearly starved, I called to the only creatures who could hear my voice. Sometimes noses pointed toward my scent, they approached. Sometimes thrown rocks made them dash and scatter. I spent a year like this, alone, then visited, then alone. Into the fire that blazes and engulfs, Sex with sudden force, love, compulsion, fear, and the violence itself until my arms spread black feathered and talons flare. When I am a person again, I will descend the switchback trail, a blurred shape, then clear to find you unfasten the sack strapped to my shoulder and raise to your open face the first true thing I have for us to eat. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. Of course, that was that was dope. Hi everyone, thank you for, for making time today to be here with us, uh, making time for poetry. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I'm just gonna get into uh, the first three poems I'm gonna read are um, about guided by what's on my mind and what's on everybody's mind in uh, America right now. Uh, this first poem is called American Studies. 
My wife tells me of reading the Dear America books as a child. Those stories told via the diaries of young women who lived during difficult times in American history. In these stories, filled with suffering were the facts behind the suffering. Her favorite involved the RMS Titanic, the unsinkable ship that sank. I ask if trying to imagine what it looked like was what captivated. And she says, no, says only one book led to another until she realized she could never see it nor accept it. After the election, my friend explains he feels he could manage here, but not his children. He explains he spoke to their school director who comforted by talking about police presence. But if there's police, he asks, before anything happens, what will happen when something does? American algebra. Everything is X until proven Y. Dear America, if X represents what my friend feels thinking about the police, what language do you imagine he worries his children speaking publicly? And what language are we speaking right now? Show your work. Another friend writes me, here is a verse. I think about a lot, and maybe the mirror of the world will clear once again. She shares she's been sick since the election, as I have been. I imagine our voices trying to commiserate between coughs. In physics, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. What American physics happens here as I read and hear her voice behind the verse she sent? Are you, dear America, afraid as I am? that our faces will no longer be there when the mirror clears. All right, I purposefully didn't um, share the origins of that poem. I wrote that poem. Um, it's in this anthology here, uh, Dear America, put out by uh, terrain.org. Um, but I wrote it after the 2016 election. But I feel like the word election is very um, heavy right now. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and I feel like it resonates still. Uh, this next poem is from the uh, next, um, the Breakbeat Poets Volume 4, Latinx. It's a Latinx focused um, volume of the Breakbeat Poets anthology. If you're not familiar with the series, I encourage you to check them out. Um, it is poetry from different communities um, that is uh, influenced by hip hop. And um, this poem of mine that made it in there is. Um, it, it remixes things. I remix the uh, the the folk tale of La Llorona, which means the weeping woman, um, who's the, it's a ghost tale um, that I feel uh, reflects a lot of like the double standards and, and heteronormativity, um, because the story goes that oh she's a woman who killed her kids, drowned them in a river, um, and that became the ghost story. But what people usually leave out is that. The reason she did that is because her man cheated on her. So as always, men are at the root of um, <laughs> the terrible things happening in the world. Um, so anyway, La Llorona uh, came up to me one day and uh, we, we decided to go watch a movie together. So this is me and her. Um, we went to see the movie Troy. La Llorona watches the movie Troy. She watches Brad Pitt leap, then land a stab like a hammer blow down spends time taking in the bronze skin of the actors, the way they say grass, like toss, todo British. She snags popcorn by the handful, watching the gods be shrugged off by warriors. During the scene where the Greeks scurry from the Trojan horse, their shadows fingers pulling at string and unraveling the night, her breath is sand and crackling flame. When they run toward fire in the desert, toward collapsing roofs and digit eyes screaming. The montage of faces of bodies pushing against each other has her whispering to no one in particular, mira Baghdad, mira Juarez, mira the Capitol building. And no one in particular hears her over the Dolby of swords being unsheathed. She begins to hum, letting her voice hit the same notes as the opera singer overlaid during the carnage. Should anyone look over, they would see the silhouette of a woman in the third row, treating the 40-foot screen like an altar. When, after seeing the toppling of statues and the scavenging through offerings to Apollo, sun god, the one who sees everything, 
the aged and fallen king staggers in defeat and cries out, have you no honor? Have you no honor? She gasps and nods as if watching a telenovela unfold according to how she would want it. Truth is, she has seen all this before, has drowned the brown bodies, has plucked gold coins from river water before any boatman could make his way to her. She knows the blonde and blue-eyed have arrived to play both hero and love interest again. And that though Helen here is a vagabond Marilyn, she used to have un poquito de chile in her blood, y un puñal de lodo in her heart. That's why it is a woman who says, if killing is your only talent, then it is your curse and says it like one slapping their hand against the river, a sting in their hands for a while. Truth is, there will always be a Brad to leap and hit hard, the thud through the speakers like a heartbeat. And uh, yeah, yeah, La Llorona, me and her hanging out. She's, she's funny. Um, my second collection of a series of poems, and we hang out at a cafe, go to the movies, we hang out at a saloon because we're we're old school. Uh, one last poem. Um, this one comes from a manuscript in progress, but um, that is bookended. The book starts with a poem in which my mother asks me a question before the 2016 election, and then it ends with this poem that I'm going to share with you, which is. Um, a series of questions after the election uh, between me and my mother. Um, and this one's based off a story. Anyway, because um, yeah, the, the, we haven't stopped living in 2016, it feels like. So this is um, uh, questions after the election. In her story about being told by her white bosses, white secretaries, vote Trump, you better vote Trump. As she punched out from work as usual, tired and body sore, does my mother know? She gathered the darkness of each corner of the factory and the darkness of the drive home, switching between stations, nothing sounding right. And the darkness in her mind, listing all the work waiting for her at home and the darkness of the night over Corpus Christi, Texas. And how these darknesses spill over now into every word I'm urged to write. Because nights like these are ink and her story of pretending not to hear, but telling you what she heard, what was said, is a story of darknesses being separated, made distinct as words on a page, which is a place to hold darkness in one form until we close our eyes and darkness shifts to darkness shifted. At the end of her shift, does my mother know about the darkness I will hold for her? And so this idea of holding, holding space, um, of building with each other um, has been on my mind a lot um, uh, for years, but specifically during the pandemic. Um, and a lot of it has to do with these virtual readings. I love taking part in them because they, again, I, I really, whatever y'all have survived to, to be here and, and sharing this space with us, thank you. Um, and taking this time to, to, to listen to poetry, to be around these ideas, around the, the magic of language. Um, it's meant a lot. And even though um, and we, and me and my partner, we've been necessarily isolating, um, I feel like a lot of community happens even in these virtual spaces. I teach online too, and so I, I felt community there as well. Um, this is all to say that I want to dedicate this um, other part of my reading to any of you who have been impacted by COVID-19 through losses of someone close or someone who has experienced a similar loss. Like at this point, it is, um, it is. Um, and I, I'm going to read two poems from uh, my book from Early Press, An Empty Pot's Darkness. Um, this poem, uh, this book is um, a series of, of poetic sequences. So they're going to hear me like, you're going to see me flip pages and read short poems. And um, 
the first is going to be this allergy to a, a friend of mine that died from Corpus Christi. Um, uh, his name is Dennis Flynn, and I'm going to read a, the, the closing section. But it's a it's a book primarily engaged with this idea of death and honoring it, um, and and how we carry each other through our words, right? Uh, through the stories we tell each other, and then we tell other people from those we've lost, uh, who we, we don't really lose, um, but but who yeah we have to depart from. So yes, um, I will be reading a section dedicated to my friend Dennis Flynn, who passed in 2010, and to kind of set up the world of these poems. You're going to hear me mention um, his house without electricity, where I, and I spent a, a year living with him in uh, shortly after college. And it, it is what it is. I mean, it's not a metaphor. Like I know, you know, my poet, my poets, my poetry, my literature. Uh, minded people, they're like, what's the metaphor of uh, a house without electricity? I'm like, no, it was a house without electricity. Sometimes it'd be that way. And um, so we lived together for a year. Um, and I wrote poems, had no money, but I wrote poems and got drunk a lot, but I'm not going to tell you about that tonight. So this sequence is called For Dennis Flynn. Promise me you'll never put me in a story. I unfold these words from others said over 10 years and wish they would leap to more. Advice, jokes, living well in your wallet. When you took it out and wrote my name alongside your wish to be cremated, the page creased like your face. My room in your house was bare. I painted the walls green for no other reason than it made you laugh. Living there, I hear you turn and shuffle papers until I couldn't. The day you died, I didn't know it until days later. You gave me a door to make a desk, set it across cinder blocks, a door between the floor and ceiling. I began to write. I would knock sometimes when stuck, the echo short, but enough for me to want to listen. Did you write this on the door? I still see you hold the page as if you could walk through it. Never told me not to put you in the earth. I have dreams where you are soil and stone. I go to speak, grit kicks my tongue, white and gray dust, the color of moths at your screen door, the year you kept me off the streets and writing in your house. I just did what anyone would do, you'd say through the white and gray dust of your beard. You lived without power, like a grudge, lit lamps and others puzzled. This is just how one lives. The nights I lived there, I stumbled in the dark and wrote my poems by the light of a kerosene lamp. When the light gave out, I would write by the moon. When the moon gave out, I would write, trusting the words would still be there in the morning. You spent afternoons in your armchair in and out of sleep. You'd call my name to see if I was around. Evenings you'd go house it, leaving me the dark. Since you died in someone else's house, no one's explained it to your armchair. He is sleeping in another life. When he wakes, you'll know it when you creak. One night, a friend began to kick and spit against another car after locking her keys in hers. You yelled her name until she stopped. She asked us to stay, moved cat litter so I could sleep on her couch. Some have it nice, you said. We have poems. We're the diversity they speak of. No plot then, no arc, no denouement. The day you turned ash, I wasn't there. I can tell it like you might through white gray words. You rest in pieces. Perhaps you'd laugh. You merely left scraps, a chuckle, a crackle in your throat. You left life as broke as you had lived. I can almost hear your armchair creak. <laughs> Uh, 
and uh, it's a heavy, heavy book. It's a little thin book, but a pesao. Um, it's heavy. Um, so about in this book, it's my weirdest book. It's my weirdest book yet. Many more to come. Um, right. But um, what I what I enjoy about this book is that I, it, it's like these bulky sequences that that engage that elegize friends. I also have one dedicated to Octavio Paz, the uh, Mexican writer um, and poet, and also to La Llorona. La Llorona shows up again here. And um, but I wanted to close that. How do I close this heavy book? You know, and it's a book I've never really closed. Um, so I have this sequence at the end called An Empty Pot's Testament. And I, I use the word testament, meaning in terms of will and testament. And it's like tapping into a tradition, two traditions. One is a France, François Villon, the poet who was a, like a, this thief in France during the Black Plague. You like look him up, he's, he's wild. Um, mm -hmm. But he, he's famous for a long sequence of poems called The Testament, the, like of François Villon. And it's, it's very elegiac in his own way. But I'm also thinking of Pablo Neruda, who closed the, the, the book Canto General, which is the, this great poem to Latin America and history um, and, and the calling out capitalism and the, the conquest and everything. It's a great book. But he closes it with this very like direct poem being like, Yo soy Pablo, and it's February, and I'm, I'm writing this to, to close this book. And so I'm like, OK, this is kind of this personal public statement. I'm like this, like if I'm writing a book about mortality, I gotta include myself in there as well. Um, so anyway, uh, this book is called uh, An Empty Pot's Testament. I was born in the eighth month of 1982, a year with an eight in the not quite middle. Already things were uneven by being even. Four numbers means no middle, means it cut in half my birth year with the empty space, absence, really. Nothing here. Now that I have erased myself, I can begin. Memories of Matamoros merge with those of Corpus Christi. Each stretch of four syllables vital to my life to explain where I come from. Eight syllables hanging on air. When I speak them, nothing matters. But nothing I am in language. This my roots and origins lost any exactness of the word, Jose. It means another man, another presence signified in another city and life where he lives so far from where I live now, yet here, my father now. I hear my mother clearer in memories of when we shared rooms from leopard to navigation, to garage apartments, to where she lives still now on Ramsey Street. Our voices traveled argued, wore the other down until one left. In stanzas now, echoes resounding. In Italian, la stanza means room. In Spanish, it's cuarto. Move one letter over, you have four. Cuarto, cuatro, cuarto, cuatro. Like a heartbeat, the R takes turns being part of a place and then concept. What I mean is the rooms I sat silent in when young, pen in hand, what's held there? Around the lion starves the young, around a fever starves the heart, around my twenties lions paced, my heart starved the young man I was. It felt fever, my heart favored, it felt lion's teeth grazed my breath, my breath passed where no food paced, young lion pacing where no cage was. When I was wasting away, hands were moving to fill in the space with words that I couldn't talk then, but talk now. Lungs like pockets I keep rummaging through, holding up a turn of phrase. Just try me. Here it give over to, just tie me. Float away to, just dying. In my 30s, I'm just joking until I'm not. After my death, my favorite clothes will grow cold like a room where everyone cleared out of. My favorite words will grow careless, push past others on their way out. My fondness for counting out each syllable 
will be left behind to grass, I leave behind sunlight. To sunlight, I leave behind rain. To rain, I leave behind your name. To your name, I leave behind peace. To peace, I leave behind my scars. To scars, I leave behind healing. To healing, I leave behind wounds. To wounds, I leave behind pulsing. When I felt my pulsing leave me in the emergency room, when I bled out and was nothing but the pain of each breath and the fear in between, when Cincinnati seemed the last city I would ride in, my wife found herself praying, found words to break the silence I caused. I have wanted to say something of my living, which is dying, which is a shoelaces tightness in each step, which is moving on which is a metaphor, which is what one finds in writing, which is what I do when not living how others see fit, which is the end. Thank you uh, once again for, um, for listening. I believe we will be moving on to a uh, Q&A now. Thank you both so much. That was really wonderful. We do have a few questions in the Q&A and please, anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question, feel free to submit that in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we've gotten several people writing in just to tell you how much they've loved your reading. So thank you <laughs> for doing that. Um, and the first question we have is, um, this question is inspired by Megan's anger poems, but is a question for both of you. How does poetry provide a vessel or vehicle for anger? Um, well, I can start. Um, I, I did a lot of reading about anger um, over the past few years um, because of that project that I was working on, um, which I started because I and everyone around me were feeling unbearably angry. Um, anger is a really interesting emotion, I think. Um, I think the best way to think of it is, um, is as a wave, right? So anger comes, it starts rising, 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 and, um, and as it's rising is where a lot of people try to shut it down. Um, and then you get symptoms like anxiety and depression. Um, but if you act when you're at the top of that wave, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes, right? So, so I think poetry can do a couple things. I think, um, I think it can attune you to what that feels like to have anger come and crest and leave um, or dissipate. And, and I think um, I've tried to write poems at all different parts of that wave. And the part where it didn't work was like way up here because that's, that's when you get into your like most basic <laughs> instinct of like um, wanting to hurt someone or wanting to run or wanting to say something terrible. Um, I think anger has a lot to teach us about things that we might need to do in our lives, like set boundaries and certain relationships, um, do political activism. Um, but, but we do those things kind of as the wave is receding. And, and so I think like there's poetry that maybe you write on your own. That's, that's as that wave is going up, that might not be completely um, productive or helpful. And then there's poetry that you write as the wave is receding and that is like healing is coming and is helping healing along. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's that's what I've got, I guess. Oh, no. um, thank you all for the question. Um, if I have to think about my relationship with anger and poetry, um, it makes me think, um, that as a person of color, like I've had to 
like not show anger in so many spaces. And I mean, this is even as like a kid, you could kind of like put in this position of like, and Marshall, everyone is marginalized kind of gets this kind of like programming, I suppose, where, um, yeah, you're not supposed to show anger, especially uh, especially as a brown male, like, hey, you're a male of color, like you're already seen as um, the store owners looking at you one way. <laughs> uh the authorities are looking at you in different other ways you're getting pulled over um and um and even now even being a faculty member i've got a phd and i still have to um um i'm still learning lessons on how to speak up which is part of what is to be understood about anger um because i've just been made to feel bad about it and um and even in, in poetry writing you would think it's like oh it's the imagination you can do a persona i'm like no no i can't uh, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm me, I believe is what I have to say in response to that. Um, everyone is allowed creative freedom except for me is uh, sometimes how we feel, right? But um, anger on the page um, has been a positive lesson in terms of um, not seeing enough of it out there. Um, because yeah, especially poetry, I'm like poetry, like if I look at when I, when I fell in love with poetry, uh, like second grade on through high school, like that time period. Um, like poetry was Yeats. Yeats was never angry. If he was angry, it was big words, right? Um, and I, before people get in the chat, Yeats was angry, but um, I get it. But um, it sounded pretty, and there wasn't a, a space for ugliness. And it wasn't until later where I found um, writers who were able to express anger, to express the, the uglier sides uh, of life that I could relate to. Um, um, and uh, that that's when I really was like, oh, that's allowed on the page. Um, and again, that, that the language of permission, like that's allowed. Um, but yeah, like I feel like I'm, I'm learning now, similarly to like being in academia or being an, an adult, like, cause I still, uh, when you're, when I'm put in my place, so to speak, um, even as an adult, um, and this has even happened recently, with some, anyway, not gonna go into that. Um, but yeah, whenever I'm, I'm put on the spot, um, it's like I could have a whatever accomplishments to my name, but I'm still a brown person. I'm still a, to, to the, in, in these incidences where I'm talking or in these spaces, in white spaces, uh, the creative writing workshop or, or the um, you know faculty somewhere. Um, and I'm like, you know, I, I think I can best put it in terms of a tweet. I, put out where it's like I've learned that in academia I could be insulted wearing a suit or wearing a t-shirt and t-shirts are more comfortable uh, not to like quote myself but like I did um, and that's where the poetry reading is right is us quoting ourselves anyway um, yeah it's been liberating but not in the way you think it's not like oh now I can get in touch with my feelings I always tell students and, and my writers like just because I write poems doesn't mean I can confident that I know about my feelings or that I'm in control of them. Like I still need work, I still um, am lost. You know, I've got to figure things out. So um, poetry is a, a good space for figuring things out, but it's not where everything's figured out. It's art. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, you both engage in many different forms of writing. What are the challenges of switching writing styles? such as poetry versus journalism or criticism regularly? And, and how do you think it benefits your writing overall? I mean, I can jump into this one right quick. Um, I feel like it's not the switching writing styles that's hard. Like whenever I, I read somebody and I, I see them doing a form that I haven't tried, or is even doing a move and because I do nonfiction of all, I seem to do like a different form or bend a, a genre in a certain way. I'm like, oh, I want to try that out. That's exciting. Um, so that part's easy. Um, but it's it's the finding the right form for a given piece. That's the hard part. Um, that's the part where I'm like, oh, um, well, I tried to write a sonnet, but it sucks. So what does it need to be? Should it be a prose poem? I can move it over there. It doesn't work that way. I'm like, all right, well, does it need to be an essay? Like, I've, I've, there's been poems that have are years old because I've yet to find the right style. So I would say that's where the challenge is um, in my own experience. Um, 
So I actually was just telling Jose and Marisa before this event started that I stopped writing poetry for a few years. Um, and I did that when I was getting into nonfiction and journalism. And I think that everything that I learned from writing nonfiction helped me in going back to more, um, well, I was gonna say more creative forms, but more uh, untrue, more inventive forms, um, poetry and fiction. So, um, you know, I think becoming a journalist at 33 was extremely humbling. It was extremely humbling to do work that I was not good at and not skilled at and to have that really steep learning curve which um, poetry had become, I started writing poems when I was 13. So it had become very automatic for me um, and kind of like not challenging enough. So I moved into a world that was extremely challenging for me. And um, I think it pulled me out of myself. Like I think my poems that I wrote before that, I don't know if you can materially see the difference, honestly, if you look at the before and after but I know that now when I write, there's a more global frame always in my mind. So when I'm working on my current project on anger, um, it's, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about like, is this helpful? Is this poem gonna be useful? What are the ethics of writing about this particular person? Um, you know, or this particular situation? So I think those kinds of things have been useful. And I think it's also, you know, in journalism, you become very unimportant in a way as the writer. Um, whereas in the poetry that I wrote before, like I was the most important, you know, it was about healing me um, and my wounds. And so I think occupying a position where I'm always the least interesting person in the room I think was really helpful for me in um, writing poems about other people and especially writing fiction where I had to embody other people because I had spent years doing all this thinking about why people do the things they do um, and who people are other than myself. <laughs> uh, this next question I think actually really piggybacks off of that very well. So I think we'll close with this one. Um, you both write poems with varying voices. How do you locate the subject when you set out to write a poem if that subject is not you or is beyond you? Um, I can start, I guess. Um, I think for me, the subject the speaking voice of the poem is almost always a version of me, um, even if the poem itself is not autobiographical. So I, I, I think I have one or two pers like real like persona poems, like really, really not me and not my experience, but there has to be a huge amount of empathy there to feel it. It just, there has to be a trueness that I feel that I can't, I couldn't give you a formula as to how to get there, but um, how do you locate the subject? Yeah, so I'm not sure quite what you mean by locate the subject, but I think I always locate it as, as some part of myself. And in terms of fic writing fiction, again, like they're just, you almost, I mean, you have to get really weird and you have to start really believing that this person that you are writing in the voice of is really there and is whispering to you. And you have to feel a real responsibility to that person. Um, and, and I guess if I don't feel like that channel is open, like if I don't feel that I can hear that person fully, um, then the writing doesn't work. Yeah, no, I'll add, um, yeah, there's, I mean, with awareness more than anything, I don't know, I, I get tripped up, you got me feeling self-conscious, I'm like, well, what poems did I read? And um, I don't know if I, I, if I think about it real quick, the, the poems I read, they're all in the same voice. I quote people, like my friend Dennis said the things I say, he said there, 
um, and La Llorona said those things that she said there um, in the movie theater. Um, but this idea of like a subject being beyond you when you draw on a voice, I think uh, as Megan mentioned, one that's the ethics, like, hey, you know, we're not, it's, it's 2021, <laughs> you know, like you maybe don't, um, we're, we're like 200 plus years from Wordsworth trying to write in the voice of the people, like, no, help make those people literate, give them funding and um, let them write their own poems. Um, so assuming like the persona poem, I'm like, it's got a problematic history. Um, and so I feel like there's a lot to be reckoned with there. That is not to say I don't like um, in different voices, but I wanna say first and foremost, like before it even gets to subject, it gets to voice. Like even this morning, I was finishing up my, my yoga, porque sabes, you know, you need to do tree, you gotta stay limber. Este, um, I, I broke in the middle of it because I had this kind of thought come to me, these lines come to me, and I'm like, oh, this might be a good sequence. Uh, so I grabbed my journal real quick and just yeah, dashed off these lines. Um, and it was very, like, recognizing a voice. And it was, it's weird. Like, I'm not going to share it because <laughs> it's so conscious. Um, but this process, um, I want to say the voice comes first, at least for me. And then this, uh, as the subject gets, um, starts showing itself, starts glimpse, like I start getting glimpses of it. And then I work out, well, what is this voice saying? What is being said? And I mean, with writing, whether it's essays or, or poetry, like you don't know what you have to write until you start writing. Uh, you don't know what you're, have to, what you're thinking until you start thinking about it. Um, and then revising so much of uh, writing is, is revising and rewriting and re recreating, re-envisioning and envisioning. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like I never follow a voice um, into territory um, without questioning what's thereafter. You know, we've gone to this corner, what's in this corner, you know? So um, it's really you know, being guided intuition. You know, uh, Cezanne Milo, she talks about um, poetry being about being submissive, being passive and this passivity. Um, is real. That's why it's like, yeah, I don't go to poetry for my therapy. I go to my therapist for my therapy. <laughs> my my poetry writing is um, is this other space, and um, to work things out in that space is is both a gift, but it's also the thing that requires some kind of awareness and some kind of like mulling over. So, yeah, that's where that question takes me. Great. Well, thank you both once again so much for sharing your work with us tonight. Uh, I also want to say thank you to all of you out there for spending your evening with us. Like I mentioned previously, you can learn more about these books and purchase uh, The Animal at Your Side and An Empty Pot's Darkness at the links I posted in the chat. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I just want to say have a great night and keep reading and be well. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marisa, for hosting us. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.